When I directed Living Dead, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. Okay, it was the first film that I'd ever officially directed. I mean, I kind of co-directed some stuff before that without credit. So Return for me was a real education in how not to direct a movie, how not to manage other people. And um, I wouldn't even consider directing until I had rethought the whole process. And uh, the next picture I directed five years later, unfortunately, it's a, it's a lost film. They called it The Resurrected, which to me sounded like a religious film. And it was released direct to video in days when that was not respectable. And just as well, in any case, because what they did to me was after I got through editing the film, they took it away from me and edited an entirely new film out of outtakes. This happened to Peckinpah once at MGM with his uh, um, Billy the Kid movie. When I directed that film, I used an entirely different approach. Um, delegating. Let the people do their jobs. Now, Hitchcock... When Hitchcock directed The Birds, he, of course, hired Rod Taylor be the lead, and Rod Taylor was thrilled to be working with the great Hitchcock. But when they started shooting the first week, Hitchcock was never to be found. The film was being directed by the first AD, and finally Rod Taylor spoke up. He said, excuse me, but where is Mr. Hitchcock? AD said, oh, he's sleeping in his trailer. Now, I figured if it's good enough for Hitchcock, it's good enough for me. And I, uh, Reagan was in office at that time, and he was notorious for not doing anything. He delegated everything. So there was another good example for me. I thought, is there some way that I can do nothing and still get the film I went on, want on the screen? And, you know, what I've learned is the only disposable person on a movie is the director. Romero had years ago signed this big fat contract with his writer John Russo, giving Russo the right to write and sell and promote a screenplay with the title Return of the Living Dead. Obviously, Romero had second thoughts when he heard it was going to be made. I've never spoken to George Romero. I don't know if he likes the film or he hates it, but I worked awful hard not to step on his toes. I didn't want to make a film that was in Romero's turf for his, you know, benefit and for my benefit. He was going to go on and make more dead movies. I didn't want to get in the way of that. I didn't, for my sake, I didn't want to look like a Romero clone, and so the decision was made by me to do the film as a black comedy and to address that issue in the first scene of the movie. They sit down and they have this hopefully hilarious, ridiculous conversation about you know, George Romero and the Night of the Living Dead and how it's a big fat lie, but we're going to tell you the truth. I knew the audience would come wanting to know how this related to Romero because of the title. Is this a Romero film? Is it not? Are we ripping them off? So I said to myself, I, I have to address this. Right out front, at the beginning of the film, for Romero's sake, for my sake, and for the audience's sake. Once you see that scene, you say, oh, I get it. I videotaped those auditions and I took them home and I made my decision 
based not what I saw with my naked eye, but what I saw on my television screen at home. Some of the people showed up at the audition completely dressed as punks, and it actually got in my way, because all I could see was that costume. I wanted to see the, the performance. I didn't want to... Uh, <clears throat> my wardrobe people would supply the costume. So that didn't help. Those people who showed up dressed, overdressed like the character, made it harder for me to judge their performance. And I had a couple of really g good choices there. Some of those roles, I had, you know, there was more than one good actor that showed up for it. And, uh, those were hard decisions. I cast people who would be like the characters I wanted. I mean, there are those rare actors like Peter Sellers, Dustin Hoffman, who create a different persona for every role. Okay? But there aren't many of those people around. If I ever direct another movie again, I hope I can use, you know, some of the actors I worked with on that film. I hope I can write parts for them. Not excluding, I, I might mention myself. If I direct again, I'm going to act in it. I was an actor before all this mess happened, and I'd like to do it again. This was supposed to be a really eclectic group of kids, not everyone the same. You know, a bunch of bohemian kids, you know, today you'd call them goth, and not bad kids. I mean, I was tired of seeing punks portrayed in movies and television as villains. I knew punks. They were the nicest people in the world. I, there was only one angry punk, and that was suicide. Now, in the case of Linnea, it was easy. Everybody else that showed up was a lousy actress. First of all, she had to be willing to take her clothes off at the audition. I knew she had to be nude. She didn't necessarily have to be gorgeous nude, but she did have to be willing to be nude, and she had to be able to act. Of all the actors that showed up, the, one, the only one that could act was Linnea. And it turned out she also had a knockout body. More than I required, but I thought, well, I got it, I'm going to film it. There was a lot of discussion about a cod piece for her. That was more than a little embarrassing, but it had to be dealt with. And, you know, the makeup guy, I, I stayed away from that session when the, when the cast was made. Beverly, she was very nice. She comes off well on the screen. It's just that she's a, a shy person, you know, with, with a kind of mild manner. And, and I can be a real pain in the neck. I, I can be overpowering. I don't hate Beverly. It was simply an instance of uh, bad management on my part. Um, I mean, it takes time. When you start out life as a nobody and your career arc goes up, it takes time to learn that if you're the boss, you, where your words land hard. They land a lot harder than if you're just some schmuck. And I had to learn to temper myself and to really watch what I said lest I pointlessly hurt somebody's feelings. Before I got married and had a kid, I had guns all over the house. I used to own 10 handguns. <clears throat> and I had them just laying around where I knew where they were, okay? Um, oh, I would have them laying on a shelf with a newspaper over it. Frankly, I was a little bit paranoid. And I was always afraid the Manson family were going to come in the window some night. 
and I wanted to always have a loaded gun within reach. Now, this is not altogether rational, and uh, when I got married, I immediately got rid of all but one gun because I didn't want my wife accidentally, you know, reaching in to get her socks and shooting herself. I realized I, I couldn't live that way anymore if I had, a, you know, somebody living with me. When my son came along, I got rid of the last gun. Uh, there were just too many stories about kids breaking into the lockbox and shooting their little friends by accident. And to tell you the truth, once I was married and had Diane living with me, I was a lot less fearful of home invasion. It isn't really rational, it just shows the, the arc what one's emotions and feelings might take over the course of a lifetime. That's one of the things I had to learn to control. I mean, Otto Premier had a reputation for having a bad temper on the set. He got away with it, but I don't really respect that. I see that as a failing in me when I did blow my top. You're not supposed to handle people that way. You're supposed to handle them subtly. You can imagine that my uh, stress level was pretty high. And in addition, I went to USC film school. And in those days, at least, the orientation was toward the, <laughs> the auteur theory. The director was supposed to do everything. And um, when I started directing Living Dead, I assumed that was the case. And I went around, I ran around telling everybody how to do their job. And as a result of that, um, everybody hated me and I didn't get what I wanted anyway. So I had to revise my notions about how you direct a movie. And I do remember that there were times on that movie when I lost my temper. Now there's no excuse for this. It, it just happened. Well, here's the thing about Clue. First of all, he cares very deeply about his work. And he was not all certain about this film. I mean, how can you know what the film's gonna be like unless you're the director and have it in your head? So this could have very easily been a piece of crap, throwaway horror movie. And this had him worried. That was one problem. The other problem was he didn't get hired until the last minute. We were having a hard time finding somebody to play you know, the owner of a medical warehouse. An old, older man who was handsome and, and knew how, how to present himself on screen and how to hold the screen. And we weren't paying much, and yeah, you know. And so, I didn't meet him until he walked on the set. Okay, the first night of shooting. Everybody else, as you will recall, I had a couple of weeks of rehearsal. All those scenes of you guys together yelling and screaming were, in fact, as you know, very carefully choreographed. People see the film, they think it's just a lot of yelling. Well, as you recall, once I had you guys together, I said, here are the specific words and phrasing I want to hear. Okay? You all mark it in your script. The rest, you can yell and scream at the same time, but be sure to let this word or phrase come through. So it was a lot of rehearsal. It was very beneficial. I was thrilled with the result on the screen. It looked just like what I wanted it to look like. It looked um, chaotic. It looked like ad living. It looked like yelling and screaming, but you heard every necessary word. Clue had no rehearsal. Clue had no introduction to me. Clue had nothing. He walked cold onto the set, and it was a scene which was later in the movie, and it required a very high level of energy on the part of the actors, and Clue hadn't had a single opportunity to work up to the level that I needed. 
and I rarely do this. I know that Lacazan did it a lot. I know that Oliver Stone does it, which is to make an actor uncomfortable in order to get a result. I needed Clue to get a, to the highest level of energy. To the, this is near the end of the film where everybody's driving around, smashing into things and running. And they needed him to get there instantly. So he mounted the camera on the front of his car. And um, he got in the car with uh, Spider. And this was the first shot. And uh, <clears throat> they were supposed to drive like crazy. And just before it rolled, I went over to Miguel and I whispered in his ear, I said, once that car is rolling, once it's up to speed, I want you to tell Guru to fuck himself. Okay? Because I thought that would make Clue so mad that it would instantly pop him up to the level I need. It worked, but it started Clue off on a kind of a sour note there. He was not happy. And through the whole filming, Clue didn't have a clue. He did not know what kind of film was being made. And it worried him. Appropriately. He blew up at me a couple times in the set. I actually got to the point. You say Beverly was scared of me. I got to where I was scared of Clue. And he was carrying around this piece of lead pipe. And I thought, what if Clue comes after me with that lead pipe? So I, I, I told him to substitute a rubber pipe. So if he came after me, it'd be hitting me with rubber, but it didn't work because flu picked up and said, this doesn't have the right weight. I can't work with this. Where's the real prop? And so I said, oh, please, go, don't kill me. And I gave him the right thing. Now, film gets finished. We have cast and crew screening. Clue comes out of that screening. All smiles. He was beaming. He came over to me. We hugged each other. He saw what the film was at last, and he liked it. He saw that it was a respectable film, and it made him look good. For my part, I saw that he gave a terrific performance. Just what I wanted, only better. So, under those conditions, everything is forgiven on both sides. Tony came on the movie again with no time and no preparation. He had like maybe a week to create that half-woman corpse on the bombing table. That's no time at all to create an articulated dummy that looks good. And so I was just waiting for him to bring in this piece of half-finished crap. And when he brought that thing in and put it on the table, I nearly fell down and kissed his feet. That thing was so good. Oh, that asshole. Here's a guy at the end of his career who thinks he's slumming. Okay? Now, directors of photography in general are, well, they're like surgeons. You know, they think they're God. And they don't like receiving direction from the director. Jules Renner considered himself uh, a, a seasoned pro, and he considered me a jerk, a kid who didn't know what I was doing, and the film he thought was a piece of crap. There, there were at least two occasions when I asked Jules for a certain angle, a certain shot, when he just refused. Not in any movie, but has my name on it. And I said, well, you could take your name off it. <laughs> but he didn't go for that either. I wasn't happy with the rubber skeleton that comes up out of the grave. The one that raises its head up and opens its mouth. Where the singing begins. I wasn't... Please, technically, I was not pleased with that skeleton. I didn't think it was good enough, okay? In the scene just before that, 
All you guys were standing around the warehouse, nailing shut the door in there to keep the tar man from coming out. And it was another of those high energy, speak over each other kind of line scenes. And I didn't have time enough to line up a good master shot. We were just crushed for time, and so I just set up the camera and pointed it at you. When I saw the resulting scene, I thought, well, photographically it's not very good, but dialogue is good. It's just one scene. It's just one scene. How can you get everything you want on a movie? Even if you have a big budget. There's no such thing as a perfect movie. There were two types of music in that movie. There was dramatic underscore, which sounds basically conventional. And then there were these spot uh, songs, which were hard rock punk songs. Okay? Those you were supposed to notice and hear and listen to. And the other stuff was simply you're supposed to play under in the background and you know move your emotions. Well, for the dramatic underscore, some guy in England was hired, and he had no time at all. And we got in a mail mail pouch from England. We got hours and hours of chaotic bits of music. He just sat down and add a little bit of stretch of music, and then add another, another, and another, and another, and we had this complete mess, which sort of sounded pretty good, except, of course, it didn't, wasn't synced to the film in any respect. So I turned to the poor old uh, music editor, I said, look, I said, we've got to take the good pieces of this, and you've got to put them where they belong in the movie, and leave the rest of the stuff in the trash. Um, I was really quite concerned about that until I heard the result and I said, God damn, that works better than it has any right to work. The punk songs, Daly for some reason was obsessed on putting out a soundtrack album. He thought that because these were youth-oriented pop songs that he could make a bundle with an album. I didn't give a rat's ass about some fucking record album. I was making a movie. Uh, and so these, once again, there was no time. I didn't have the time or opportunity to audition or talk to any, any of the bands or any of the musicians. That per se wasn't John Daly's fault, it was time. A bunch of different songs, about three or four minutes or five minutes long, showed up from several local LA bands and they must have been told something about the movie because there are lyrics that relate to what's on the screen. So we just said, well, stick them where they sound best. And I was, um, I wish I could be proud of myself, but I didn't have much to do with that music. I, but I am proud of the music and I am proud of the groups, what they did. You know, I'm always a shamble at opening nights. You know, I'm the guy running down the aisle screaming, it's out of focus. So, you know, I, all I remember about its opening, and I did go to its opening in Hollywood, was a surprise that I had. I had assumed that the audience for this movie was going to be young males. And that's why I had Linnea take off all her clothes and run around and look great. When the opening a night audience appeared, they were young, all right. But it was half guys and half girls. I was stunned that all of these girls would be showing up. And if I had any notion at all, I would have had Tommy Matthews take his pants off. I was trying to aim the film at what I assumed was its audience. And I was wrong. I'll never make that mistake again. I would have had Tommy Matthews bonds up there. Uh, big pecs. I was pretty dissatisfied with the film when it was first made. 
But uh, over the years, I have come to uh, develop a fondness for that film. It wasn't quite as bad as I thought. My, you know, my standards for myself were pretty high. There were a lot of things I was not able to achieve on that schedule and with that budget. And I saw all of the defects, is what I saw when it was first made. But uh, it was a pretty good little film. As for its legacy, uh, there are two interesting things. One it now is every time you see zombies depicted, they're always shouting brains, brains, brains. And the other is um, rather curious. You may recall at the beginning of, of the film, Jimmy Caron makes a crack about their being uh, skeleton farms in India. Specifically, he says all skeletons come from India. <clears throat> all medical skeletons. And he said, I think there's a skeleton farm in India. Now, it was true that all skeletons were imported from India, but the crack about the skeleton farm was just a joke. However, about a year after Return was released, uh, the government of India shut down all skeleton exportations. And it's been very difficult in the years since then for anybody, including medical schools, to buy a real, fresh skeleton. And just by accident, I may have hit a little closer to the truth than was comfortable. And the thought that that might have actually been truthful, that that might have been what was happening, is very disturbing to me. But if that was the case, and if that film did embarrass them into stopping that traffic in human death, then, um, then I'm happy. And um, in my work, I never set out to be, um, to make a social statement. But sometimes you never know what's going to happen by accident. Over the years, the public and various audiences have treated me with the greatest kindness, and I am very grateful. The public, my audiences for my films, the people who have come to hear me speak in various venues, have been unfailingly kind and uh, I do not exaggerate when I say that I love you all. My life would not have been as good as it's been without the people that have come to my movies and come to hear me speak and responded and talked to me. So, if I die tomorrow, bless you all.